everyone, and thank you for coming to tonight's talk on crime by Dr. Sheila. Uh, this was just held over from last month, but I'm sure you'll agree it will be worth the wait. Um, after Dr. Sheen has uh, said his piece, we'll have Dennis Holmes up to talk about how she's getting on with her family and <coughs> local blog. A lot of hard work's been going into that, and we uh, really look forward to hearing an update. After that, I'll be talking you through the little leaflet we have here, uh, which basically just outlines a few more pro resources. Uh, before we start, we're not expecting any fire tests or drills, so if you hear something, just follow me, I'll be the one running real quickly. <laughs> also, if I can ask you to just check that you put your mobile phones on silent, otherwise I'll have to come and kill you. Okay, thank you very much, and without further ado, Dr. Barry Sheenan. Great, thanks. Thanks very much, Anne. Um, and my apologies for missing last month. I was for the first year. A little thing under my legs, so I wouldn't be able to actually stand up here, I suppose. Um, just to tonight's uh, talk is on crime and local history, but I just wanted to sort of clarify that a little bit at the beginning because we're going to be looking a little bit at crime and, and policing history, uh, but also and how the sources can help you actually understand the history of crime and policing in your own area. But one of the great values of crime and policing sources is that they can also provide you with a lot of information on other histories, other aspects of your local history. Um, so we'll be looking at that um, as well um, this evening. And I just wanted to draw, if people are interested in this topic, um, there is a book that I just wanted to show you, so I'm not plugging a book of my own anyway, so it's, it's, a, it's a thing called Murder Trials in Ireland. And the reason I wanted to talk about just briefly at the start was that it's one of the great things if you're beginning or, or starting in an area like this and you want to start reading and you want to start finding out about sources and so on and what you want to look at, you will always find at the back of these books a bibliography which gives you a kind of a, a beginning, a start in terms of reading, and not just books but articles. It will also direct you to kind of newspapers that the author has found useful and it will always contain a very good list, and this one does in particular, of the kind of sources that this person has used, the primary sources, in other words, the government reports, the court records, and all of that kind of material. So you'll find that one of the best places to start is with something like a secondary source like this, which actually does kind of get you um, on your way. So just to sort of, I suppose, start off with, with the, you know, the key institutions, where the key institutions that you'll be looking at in your areas to provide you with the records, the primary sources, um, and Prony here has a lot of these. Okay, so what you're doing is you're looking at, at police. Okay, so um, in the 19th century, you're looking at you know, the Royal Irish uh, Constabulary. You're going to be looking at the prison system uh, and the courts. Now, the police, um, and we'll see some of the records that they produce and intersect, and obviously they produce material for court. One of the most valuable sources um, for crime and understanding crime in your area in terms of what the police produce is what's called the County Inspector's Report. And the County Inspector writes a report every month um, to what was then the Inspector General um, of the Royal Irish Constabulary in Dublin, outlining the events in his district in the last month. Um, and so he'll give you, it'll give you brief crime statistics, it'll give you a little precise of the major events, um, and again, just one of the things that it is useful for, um, just to highlight if you're interested in different areas of history, they always contain a lot of material on industrial unrest in an area. So if you're interested in labour history, for example, and interested in the history of local strikes and so on, and, and relations between unions and employers, you actually find that the county inspector's report is actually quite good um, on those areas. Um, in terms of prisons, Obviously, things like the register of inmates, people being brought into the prison, um, and so on, where they're coming from, to be able to do a brief geographical check, maybe see how many times someone comes into the prison, comes out of the prison, sort of you know, the professional career uh, criminal, or just the unfortunate guy who gets uh, caught uh, all the time. Um, and then you have the courts, and I'll just look the courts a bit differently in a second. And they obviously produce, and Prony has excellent records here in terms of pretty from the assizes, and we're going to go um, through those as well, and the different courts and what kind of they, they deal with. But just to mention, um, perhaps another institution that you wouldn't think of as well as something like the workhouse. Um, 
the reason is that in my own research in Cork, I've come across a lot of cases where um, pretty women who've been um, the victims of domestic violence actually use the workhouse as a refuge. And so, you know, you wouldn't ordinarily think of it as being interlinked because we think of it as being part of the welfare um, system or the rudimentary welfare system of the period. But you will find that um, particularly petty criminals and so on sometimes end up there, um, you know, for a variety of reasons, or their children sometimes will end up there. So there is an overlap with something like the workhouse. Um, and you do uh, as well, just in terms of sources and records, you will find that um, the local media obviously reports on the courts. And I'm just th was thinking of um, something around the similar time of the case that I'm going to look at here. Um, 89 shows looking at the Cork Police Court, and um, there were two uh, women in their mid 70s up before the court um, for drunk and disorderly, and they managed to have over a centenary of public order convictions um, between them. So, you know, you, you, you do find that uh, sort of interesting snippets from time to time in the newspapers, and names, of course, which will lead you in particular directions, and their addresses. Uh, you know, so you can get a sense of the geographic kind of nature of the people that kind of appear before um, these events. Okay, so these are sort of various lists of police. Um, one of the things that I suppose are we have um, Belfast counties who eventually merge with the Royal Irish um, Constabulary, and there's a book on them called The Bunkies by Brian Griffin. Um, so if you're interested in sort of policing history, and it's, it's really I think one of the only the Dog Mitch Bond Police and the Royal Irish Constabulary really haven't got their full histories yet. There are short histories by a guy called Jim Hurley, um, who's looked at both the Dublin Metropolitan Police and the Royal Irish Constabulary, and they're very good from his perspective. He, he's very good with genealogy and giving you the records of the individuals who served. Um, but by and large, it's one of the things that we're missing, I suppose, in, in the historiography of crime and policing in Ireland is a substantial work on the Royal Irish Constabulary or on the Dublin Metropolitan Police. But there is one on Belfast, so there is one on the Belfast town police. Um, you obviously have the Royal Irish Constabulary. It doesn't start, of course, as the Royal Irish Constabulary. It doesn't even start as the Irish Constabulary. It starts as a Munster, Munster, kind of Connacht, Welsh Constabularies, and then it's merged. Um, you have, of course, Belfast Harbour Police. They might be an interesting. Um, uh, I had a doctor professor who saw there's a PhD in that. So there might be a PhD in, in doing a history of the Belfast Harbour Police, Blair and Dublin, all starting around the same time. And we'll kind of discuss that in a second in terms of the context of which that happens in the UK. Um, you have obviously um, a change at start of the 20th century, and that you have the Royal Ulster Constabulary emerge, um, and the Gardaí Síochána emerge in 1922. And eventually, the Guardian, of course, absorb the Dublin Metropolitan Police. Uh, I think 24 or 25, the Dublin Metropolitan Police is absorbed into the Guards, and you have one national um, police force in, in the South. You have the Irish Airport Police, which started in 1936, um, Belfast International Airport, Sabri, uh, Police Service in Northern Ireland, 2001. Um, and also, of course, not forgetting, um, there are other police forces, the Ministry of Defence Police operate in Northern Ireland, as do the Royal Military Police, and in the South, um, the Irish Military Police um, are also there. So you have a few police forces, and it seems like a long list, um, but it's not really when you compare it to somewhere like England and Wales, because in England and Wales, around the same time as the Harbour Police has emerged there, you get borough police. So most of the major towns and cities in England following on from the example of the London Metropolitan Police established kind of borough police forces. And there are, you know, um, there are a considerable amount of them. And then they're followed on by what's called the county constabularies. So, you know, every English county gets its own constabulary. And to add to the mix again, all of the private railway companies are allowed to develop their own railway police forces. Okay, so you have in one sense, it's great in the UK for a local historian because your town has its own police force for like 40 or 50 years, and your county has its own police force, and, and most of the British counties still, of course, are county constabularies having taken over the borough um, and police forces um, over various periods of time. So we don't have that kind of model in Ireland. Um, you know, we always had um, the government police for Irish constabulary, or we have larger. Um, police forces. 
And so that probably makes it a little bit different. But as I said, the Royal Irish Constabulary's records are organised on a county basis. You know, there is the county inspector's report, which is useful um, to people. Um, so you have a lot of potential sources of information. <coughs> and so just to talk about the court structure um, as well, um, you have obviously different courts in that you have what are called police courts or magistrates courts, okay? Um, the quarter sessions, the assizes, and then you can go up to House of House of Lords and High Court. The ones that you would be most interested in if you are studying local history are the first three. Um, the magistrate court, or I mean, when I'm familiar with court, it's called police court, they essentially um, only really deal with petty crime. Okay, so they do not. The current magistrate's court, which has restrictions on the fines it can levy, it has restrictions on the terms of imprisonment it can impose, it is the same with these courts. So you only find what would be relatively, I suppose, well, maybe not from the victim's point of view, but relatively minor offences. So you do get, like those two women in court, the drunken disorderly issues, um, petty theft, um, breaches of various local government ordinances, um, but they are very useful in that, again, going back to the concept of, uh, I suppose, not simply looking at this from the point of view of crime and policing history on its own. You know, these are individuals leaving a record behind um, in a way that they never would have otherwise. The, it, it records people who, if you like, potentially are not literate, um, and don't really keep diaries, don't really write letters, um, and really leave no kind of footprint behind in history. And it was one of the reasons, I suppose, that there was an explosion in crime and policing history, partly led by, I think, the OU, people like Clive Wimsley, um, to try and recover these kind of people, and to try and find out how these kind of classes <coughs> lived in a society. And as, as well, it's sort of interesting in that it's the, the 200th anniversary of Charles Dickens' um, birth this year. And when you read those records, of particularly the magistrate courts and the police courts, you do find yourself back in a kind of really Dickensian um, world. Um, and as an aside, perhaps not from Northern Ireland, but from the old Bailey records, I came across a, um, uh, you know, someone being quizzed by a magistrate. There were 12-year-old pickpockets. And he was trying to explain that he, he really shouldn't put away because he was living with his girlfriend at the time and he had to be a prostitute. So, like, you know, I'm sure the tabloids would have had a field day. You know, I also think that it might be an interesting thing to do to do a mock tabloid of that, of that period. But you find records of people, obviously, which, are, which have, no, have left no other historical footprint. And in that sense, it, uh, you know, that kind of work is very interesting because it really throws a light on the kind of areas of a town which probably, you know, people even today don't really want to look at.